Hello and welcome to today's feature author session on a romantic rendezvous lockdown with Julia Quinn. Welcome Julia. Hi. Yeah, absolutely delighted to have you here and um, I'm thrilled to be speaking to you and I am a huge fan so if I gush um, everybody forgive me. Um, just a reminder to all our uh, viewers that um, Julia is taking part in our treasure hunt and so she'll be holding up her code at the end so don't forget to watch out for that. Um, in addition, Julia has been kind enough to agree to do two sessions with us so there will also be an Ask Me Anything session so make sure you keep an eye out for that because we'll be covering different territory. I'll start with an overview of Julia's career and then I'll ask as many of my long list of questions as we have time for. Julia is a best-selling historical romance writer and the creator of the Bridgerton family, soon to appear on screens everywhere, courtesy of Netflix. She has sold over 10 million copies of her books in the US alone, and her novels have been translated into 32 languages. She's appeared on the New York Times bestseller list 19 times and counting. Her books are noted for their humor and sharp, witty dialogue, she has won three Rita Awards for The Secret Diaries of Miss Miranda Chase, On the Way to the Wedding, and What Happens in London. She has been featured in numerous publications, including a profile in Time magazine. Her most recent release is First Comes Scandal. Julia has a great website, and you can find out heaps more about her at https colon forward slash forward slash juliaquinn.com including a link to her Instagram feed, which is fabulous. So if you want to know where to find her, that's where to look. Um, so Julia, when I was doing some research for this interview, I read that your first attempt at writing a romance novel was a Sweet Valley High um, when you were a teen and you took up the challenge because at the time your dad disapproved of your reading material. Um, has he changed his mind about romance since those years? Very much so. And it wasn't actually Sweet Valley High, but sort of in that sweet dreams in that vein of that type of book. And so I was reading, I actually didn't like Sweet Valley High that much, but I liked things that were very similar. And I had been reading them over the summer for fun. And my dad said, you know, do you get anything out of this? And I, you know, went on about reading for pleasure and how important that is. And he said, well, that's true. And he, 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 he said, but he, he just, he wasn't really buying it. And I said, well, I'm also, this is also for, uh, uh, you know, vocabulary words. And he said, you find me a word in here that you don't already know. <laughs> and I couldn't. <laughs> and so then he, I said, well, I'm doing research because I want to um, write one of these. And he said, that's great. So he sat me down in front of the computer. And this was, I think, 1983. Um, so not very many people had computers, but we did. And... I apparently wrote two chapters that first night. He kept peeking in to waiting for me to give up. I was like, no, no, no. So um, that was the beginning. That was the beginning. So dad can take some credit for all of that. <laughs> yeah. And he's, you know, he's one of my biggest fans now. So that's. Uh, no, that's fantastic. He, he likes. To, yeah. What he likes to say. <laughs> oh, he just likes to say, you know, he, when people talk about it, he said, you know, what she's doing, she's writing extremely well-written entertainment. You know, he says, you know, she's not, it's sort of like, you know, are you trying to write, you know, an art house movie versus Seinfeld or something? Yeah. Well, we yeah. all think Seinfeld's great and very well written, but we wouldn't necessarily try to, you know, judge it against an art house movie. I personally wouldn't want to judge an art house movie against Seinfeld, but um, he's just saying these are two different things and, and you can do one really, really well. And, and I think he gets that now. Oh, that's great. That's, that's really good. The more advocates out there for um, good entertainment, the better. I think so. Uh, when did you make the decision to switch to trying to write historicals? Um, that's actually the, when, when I really started writing, that's what I was reading. So that's what I tried. It's, it's not really a switch. That's, I, I don't necessarily count my, I did write an entire novel in my teenage years, a teenage novel, but I, I don't really count that as this, in this part of the same thing. Um, so when I really started, you know, in, on a career path, the first mm -hmm. thing I did was historical. I haven't really switched. Okay. And uh, can you remember the name of the first historical romance you read? I can't. I've, you know, I get asked that from time to time and I don't know. Um, I know there was definitely some um, 
Jude Devereaux. Mm -hmm. And I can remember my grandmother used to get Good Housekeeping magazine and they used to have a bridge novels in there. And I know there was a Kathleen Woodowis in there. Um, but I, I honestly can't remember what the first one was. Okay. And did, was there one particular one you read that made you think, oh, I'd like to write something like this? Um, I think I, I sort of rediscovered romance novels. You know, in my first couple of years of college, I kind of had stopped reading for a bit. And then, and I think it was really Judith McNaught who kind of brought me back in again. Okay. Um, and then I think that um, witty dialogue is a particularly noticeable feature of um, particularly the best historical romance writers. I remember as a teenager sitting in the exam room after we I'd finished my um, test and uh, we were allowed to read and I was giggling over one of her uh, Georgette Hyer's books and, mm -hmm. and getting some odd looks. Um, is, um, is humor something you work at inserting or, or is it something that just comes naturally to you? I think, I think it's just part of my voice. I, um, I mean, I'm conscious that it, of doing it, yes. but it's not hard. I don't have to remind myself to try to make things funny. Just kind of, these are the characters I create. They, they tend to see humor in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of my stories are not, you know, filled with really great bits of drama. I mean, they're, they're dramatic moments, but it's not, there aren't too many life or death situations. And um, so I think it just, it just comes naturally. It's just part of who I am and who the characters are. Um, now, um, you, you're probably best known for your Bridgerton books. What was the initial inspiration for the series? I don't remember. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Bad question. <laughs> no, it's, I think it's a perfectly fair question, but um, I think people forget that the first Bridgerton book came out 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not even a teenager anymore. It's, it's you know, uh, the series is in its 20s. And I mean, I can, I, I can't remember the process that went into coming up with it. I can remember you know, bits and pieces. I, I did change how I wrote the synopsis a little bit. I spent, the first time I spent a bit more time on the characterization than I ever had before, and I think that helped make it a deeper and more interesting novel, but um, I don't remember the process of coming up with it. It wasn't, I do know it wasn't initially intended to be an eight book series. I think I was okay. going to do a trilogy, because everybody did trilogies, you yeah. know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, um, with the Rokesby series, you've gone a generation back. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever given any thought to going a generation forward um, into the Victorian era? Uh, you froze for a second, but I think I got oh. the question. Um, I don't know. I haven't decided. Um, I will say, if I start going a generation in the other direction, you start getting into some way less attractive clothing. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I'm not really that into that. Um, I haven't haven't decided. I I've been taking kind of a longer time off between books than I normally do. I think for a number of reasons, not the least of which is you know COVID nineteen and the coronavirus, and um, just all of a sudden I had a lot more. I felt I needed to spend a lot more time and devote it to my immediate family. My husband's an infectious disease doctor, so he oh, wow. has been okay. incredibly busy and and stressed and overwhelmed and overworked, and so. Um, I feel like my main job right now is supporting him. Um, I feel a little bit more like a housewife than I ever have in my life, but I just, he's just working so hard that I just, but. Okay. Um, um, or maybe that may just be what I'm telling myself because I've been taking so much time off, uh, but I haven't really decided what I'm gonna do next. I don't think it's going to be the next generation, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. I, I would never say no, but I. Um. I, I was going to ask you about your husband because I read that he was a doctor. And so um, I, I hope that um, everybody's holding up. <clears throat> I thought that we might um, talk about that in our next session. Um, but I think that COVID-19 has had a really big impact on everyone, especially families where um, one of the members or more is a health professional and mm -hmm. is sort of on the front line every day. So um, I think that it makes a great deal of sense that you just have too much on your plate right now to Yeah, um, he's not, 
actually, for the most part, not directly treating patients. So I don't have that worry about, I, I don't have as much concern in terms of contagion as I think many spouses of frontline workers are. He's moved primarily into an administrative role, um, but it is incredibly just difficult and wrenching what he has to do. I mean, he's putting in place protocols for the entire hospital in terms of, he, he's in charge now of COVID infection control. So in charge of just all over the hospital. And then there's lots of smaller things where he has to consult on specific cases. And then there's really horrible things where he has to decide who gets to say goodbye to their dying parent. Mm. Uh, because people are in the hospital dying of, you know, quote unquote, regular things too. Mm. And so, mm. you mm. you know, I just, sometimes I can hear half of a phone call and, and, you know, I don't hear names or anything. People's privacy is still protected. But I, one time I could tell the woman who was dying of heart failure and you know she was an older woman it was you know it was sad but not tragic and but you know she had several children and they wanted to say goodbye and this is in the height of the time when the hospital was short on masks and they were deciding and do they get to say goodbye and he has to make that call and I think it I think in terms of the emotion mm. it really wears you down and he's just been just exhausted by it all and it's um it's it's fascinating and horrible to watch it, it's both at once. But um, here in Seattle, we've been doing really, really well with coronavirus. So that's been lucky. We were the first spot in the United States to have deaths. So we were, for a little while, everyone's like, ooh, ground zero. But actually, we've we really, our health system here has really risen to the occasion. And um, the infection rate actually within the hospitals is lower than the general population. So um, okay. wherever yeah. people are getting it, they're not getting it at the hospital. So that's good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, well, um, it's a, yeah, it's a sort of a cloud hanging over us all the time, isn't it? And uh, we just have to try and uh, find our pleasures where we can. And I mm -hmm. think that people are reading uh, more entertainment and sometimes revisiting old favorites just for the, the comfort of um, kind of knowing what's going to happen. Um, I think you're right. I think people are turning to romance novels and, and just other, their favorite types of books and reading for pleasure uh, more. And you know, people have been asking me things like, what do you think is going on with the publishing world? And, and, and in some ways it's, it's very difficult because for the physical books, it's been incredibly difficult. People can order from Amazon and other stores like that. But in terms of you know, the actual bricks and mortar bookstores, it's been just horribly difficult for them. But on the other hand, Unlike a number of other uh, industries with publishing, at least we have eBooks, mm. and so uh, people are being. You know, I think a lot of people are just switching how they're getting books. So people are getting the books, but I do think, um, in terms of our independent bookstores, I know a lot of authors, myself included, have been working very hard to try to support them. Mm. Um, so I've been working with my local bookstore, uh, University Books, here in Seattle, and for several years now I've been working with them to sign books so that people all over the world can get an autograph book even if they can't attend a book signing and we just did I just did an extra big push this time around you know just said let's all you know if you're planning to get the book when I get it here you can get it signed and we did we actually they sold just so many books I signed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books with them and it was really really wonderful um I have some pictures on Instagram of me just with you know, huge carts of books, and I, you can see my mask and my gloves, and you know, it just, it was really great. Oh, well, that's fantastic, and I think that um, the book industry's been a little bit luckier than some, like, for example, the music industry, where um, mm -hmm. they don't, I mean, yes, you get music online, but it's not quite the same as um, the, the revenue a concert generates for a yeah. artist. Yeah, that's, that's a huge thing for them. So, um, so we have been fortunate in, in that respect. Um, just going back to your uh, books, um, were you aware that your agent was talking to Shondaland about developing a screen production for the Bridgertons? And how did you feel when you heard it was gonna go ahead? Um, yeah, well, I mean, no agent would have talks like that without being in contact with the author. Um, they actually approached us. So he called me, you know, he got a call from a representative of hers basically asking, are the rights available and is, would she be interested in talking to us? So of course I said, yeah. <laughs> and it was kind of crazy because it was not like anything I'd ever 
thought could happen. It had never happened to anybody in historical romance and not really many people in contemporary romance either to have a production company of that um, stature approach you. Um, at the time she was not, had not yet signed her deal with Netflix though. So um, it became a very different prospect once that happened. Um, but yeah, it was very exciting, but it took a really long time. It was um, a full 18 months of the, so I had to keep it a secret a really, really long time. <laughs> yeah, that must have been uh, something you had to bite your tongue over. <laughs> yeah, I think it took um, almost a year to actually sign the deal from the first approach um, to, to finalize everything. And, and a large part of that, you know, during that time, Shonda, Lynch, Shonda Rhyme signed her deal with Netflix, and then all of a sudden they took over the negotiation. So it just it changed up a bit. Um, and then there are all sorts of things I never knew about in terms of that whole process. Um, so that took about a year. And then even once it, we'd signed on the dotted line and the, the option officially started, it was still another, I believe, six months before uh, it became a public announcement. Okay. Um, and now uh, uh, moving on to your Smith Smith Quartet. Um, I, uh, I always have to check that because I, I, my brain just never knows quite whether it's Smith Smith or Smith Smith. Um, My <laughs> but um, um, I, I just love that quartet and I, I want to know where you got the inspiration for those excruciating music of. Well, what's actually interesting is that so the Smythe Smiths actually made their first appearance in my third book. I, most people don't realize that, which was back in, came out in 1996. It's called, it's called Minx. And um, I had the situation where I needed to put my two main characters at some sort of public function, but where they could kind of still talk to each other. And, you know, people will often whisper to each other at a concert. So I decided, okay, we'll put them at a musicale. Um, and that's good. They're sitting next to each other for a while. And then I just thought, uh, well, bad music is much funnier than good music. So I, I decided to do that and it kind of worked out. And then and probably a good five years went by before I put them in another book and then they showed up in another one. And it just ended up becoming this, this ongoing joke. And I, I, I kind of like having ongoing jokes that go on between books. And then it was interesting. I kind of had the idea that maybe I might write a book about them, but readers weren't really asking. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I just started hearing more and more readers going like, we want the Smythe Smiths, we want the Smythe Smiths. And so then I thought, okay, yeah, we can do it. And then in terms of like what they sound like, I mean, anybody who's been to an elementary school orchestra, <laughs> I mean, yeah, and the, it's, it's so horrible. The kids think they're doing such a great job and they're trying their best, but it just, I sort of pictured that. <laughs> but it was interesting because then I had to figure out like how to, I'd always made it sound like, okay, it always looks like there's one girl there who knows that they really suck. And, mm -hmm. um, but as it turned out, there were more than one. Um, and I was like, okay, well, why would they fake it? Why would they? So, so I tried to come up with a backstory and thought, you know, well, maybe there is this one girl who knows they're terrible, but like loves the family aspect of it. And then, yes, I came. Anyway, it's fun to come up with different backstories from all. And then, of course, there is Daisy, who I didn't write a book about her, but she truly did think they were wonderful. And <laughs> I'm, I'm still shocked when I get, um, occasionally the reader will ask me to write Daisy's book. And I'm always saying, Are you, she has no sense of humor. I can't write a book about Daisy. <laughs> Seriously, you want a book about Daisy? She's the worst. Uh, uh, she might need somebody who has an ex yeah a really good sense of humor too. <laughs> I don't know. I no, there will be no book for Daisy. I just I can't do that. Not happening. Um, no. <laughs> so, um, which part of the writing process do you or do you have a favorite part of the writing process? I get. I guess is it the sort of creative aspect or the editing aspect? Or? No, it's being done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, um, sorry. It's like, I, we're in a flight path here, so you can hear an airplane. Um, I don't know. I, it's hard to say because I edit as I go along, so I don't really feel like I have an editing process. So to me, that's just part of the writing process. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. It's more specific moments. Like in any part of the stage, you'll get this moment where everything's just going really well. And that's, it's kind of like, that's my favorite thing. And it might happen in different parts of the process. Um, 
but no, I wouldn't say I have a specific favorite part. I, well, I guess I could say I don't like proofreading. That I, I, I can tell you which parts I don't like. I don't like proofreading. Um, I don't particularly enjoy doing my copy edits, although that's usually pretty quick. Um, I don't know. And um, about dialogue, I mean, we have um, uh, most of our members are readers, but we also have a large proportion of members who are writers or aspiring writers, because of course, if you want to write, you love to read. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any tips for writing great dialogue? <laughs> You know, I've given, it's the only workshop I give. I always joke, I'm too lazy to devise another one on writing dialogue. Um, and, and you can probably, you can find that online in a number of different places. If people want to just do a little search, I bet they can find that in terms of tips. Um, and uh, I don't really know how to like sort of sum up anything right now. I mean, except that I, I would tell people, um, one, uh, be careful that your readers are speaking to each other, not to the reader. I mean, that your characters are speaking to each other, not the readers. A lot of times people try to do like an expository info dump at the beginning, yeah. and they have the, the characters say things to each other that clearly they wouldn't say to each other. It's clearly for the benefit of the reader, and that, that's, not, so that's something to watch out for. And then also just, if you're not sure if your dialogue feels natural, read it out loud, and you'll know if it's stilted or... or um, I think a common misstep is to have one character talk for too long, yes. you know, before the other person chimes in or interrupts them or something. So uh, read it out loud and you'll know. Okay. Um, now, um, have you learned any of the skills that come up in your book? I, I think of this particularly with dancing because um, dancing was such an important part of um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of social interaction during the Regency. And um, you write such lovely dance scenes as well. So I, I, I don't know Regency dancing. I, maybe I should. I know that for the Netflix show that they did hire a dance instructor and all of the actors had to take dancing lessons to learn all that stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't get to witness any of that. Um, I did visit the set a couple times, but not during any, any dance scenes. Um, other skills? Um, Boxing, you know, for example, maybe. Um, what? Boxing? Uh, no. Do I have boxing characters? Uh, in um, the, is it the Marcus and I, one of your heroes um, does some boxing. <laughs> it's terrible. There is boxing in the show too, but uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't say I've acquired, uh, my characters like to read and I'm, I'm good at that. <laughs> um, and then um, in terms of uh, research, do you, um, do it all online? Do you take um, field trips? Uh, um, well, I mean, I, I love to travel, so I, I do that when I can. Um, I, Lord only knows when we'll be able to do that again. But most of it's online. I don't usually do a great deal of uh, research before I start a book because I have a fairly broad, I kind of joke it's very broad and shallow knowledge of, of British history. So there are things I don't need to look up before I get started. I don't, I understand how the society works. I don't need to know how you address a duke. I don't, stuff I don't have to look up. But as I go along, there will be specific items that I'll need to research. And I usually do that as needed in the book. Okay. So I may spend the book, uh, maybe as needed as I go through the book. I'm sorry, Julia, I'm going to ask you just to repeat that last bit because um, I lost you on the, the connection. Um, okay. You were just saying that you, you tend to do the research as you're going, if you need that, to. That's pretty much what I was saying. Um, if the book is set somewhere outside London, then I might um, spend a few days researching the area where I'm setting it, maybe picking out like a house to model a house on, something like that. But for the vast majority of my research, it's as needed as I go along. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite character? No. <laughs> and I couldn't, you, you couldn't pick one. And I couldn't pick a favorite book either before you ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about your cover art. Um, so you seem to, there seem to be two kind of styles. And um, so one is kind of, you know, the woman in the gorgeous dress, which I, mm -hmm. I think is partly why 
many of us read Regent's Heat just because the dresses were so beautiful. And then um, you have covers which focus more on a, a sort of um, an element from the story, a sword or an mm. invitation or a necklace or something. Um, do you um, work with the people at Avon in terms of developing the cover? A bit. Um, most of the, so I mean, the last few, I guess the last four books have all been women in a dress and the stuff that has an item on the cover has been, have lately been reprints of older books. Okay. So it really, in terms of coming up with a theme, I work with them, but it's kind of, yeah, there isn't much method to the madness, I think. I mean, I, it's not like we have this grand scheme of, all right, this type of book gets this, and this type oh. of book gets that. It just sort of falls into place. So I'm not, it's not necessarily a really good answer, but I, I mean, I do work with them. Okay, sorry, that was, got a text. Um, uh, what was I saying? I do work with them to develop certain elements. So, for example, um, for First Come Scandal, if you look, you'll see the Edinburgh Castle in the background because part of the book is set in Edinburgh. So that was fun. So things like that we work in, um, but I don't necessarily have a lot of input. I, I do have some veto power, though. I, I feel like I've gotten high enough up the food chain that you know if something is there's a big problem, I can be like, no, no, no. <laughs> This person looks like a child. We can't do that. <laughs> um, just going back to um, your research, is there a story or an incident um, from one of your research trips that um, stays with you that you could share with us? Um, I mean, the, just funny things, but not like, I mean, I like, you know, the time we were driving in the UK, my sister was driving because I don't drive a stick shift very well. And uh, I forgot that she wasn't supposed to have any caffeine and I'd gotten her a latte and I didn't get her decaffeinated one. And she's like trying to drive on the other side of the road and she's sweating and she's stressed. <laughs> and she's like, oh my gosh, it's like I had coffee. And I'm like, oops. <laughs> and, meanwhile, and like, there's a roundabout coming up and I'm like, around the, around the, around, or, or over it. Like she just drove right over this. <laughs> So things like that. I mean, I can't really think of like a specific, you know, like I found this incredible spot that I have to put in my book that I can't think of offhand. Although I will say in Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, there's a scene in St. Bride's Church. And that did come about because I had been living in London right before I wrote that book. And I was, I was trying to visit a whole bunch of Christopher Wren churches because I think they're interesting. And that's one of his smaller ones. Um, and I remember going in there being like, oh, this would be a nice place to set something. So there was a, that. That was kind of the only thing like that I can think of. And um, I, I know your books have been translated into multiple languages, 32, mm -hmm. I think. Um, was there, I, I mean, have, has there been one where you've been, <clears throat> excuse me, that you've been really surprised or you, or you thought, oh, that's fun. But yeah. Oh, so many. That's actually one of my most fun things is, you know, when... Now I'm in like, I wouldn't say in most major markets, but a lot of major markets. So when I get a new one, it's really exciting. So my, my newest language that I just signed a deal for is Finnish. Oh. So I will be, I'll be in Finland soon. So I, I finally hit almost all the um, Nordic countries. I'm still missing Iceland. I, I want Icelandic. Um, so that was exciting. Um, I, for some reason, I'm always tickled by the fact that I have a few books in don't get paid much to have your book translated in Bulgarian, but I don't care. I just think it's so cool that I have books in Bulgarian. It's so What else has been really cool? Um, I don't know. I think it's really interesting that um, for Portuguese, I actually have two different editions. Other than English, Portuguese is the only language that I get are published separately. So one for Portugal and one for Brazil. Um, oh, right. Like for Spanish, it's one publisher who then distributes around the entire Spanish speech, speaking world. And they have, um, there are some, uh, you know, they, they have divisions in other countries in, in Latin America, but the home base is in Spain. But no, for Portugal, I have entirely separate publishing houses in Portugal and Brazil. So I always think that's really interesting. And then it's just kind of exciting when, um, you have a new foreign publisher that you manage to develop a relationship with because with many foreign publishers, you just, you sell them the rights. I mean, you know, through your agent, whatever. And the, 
eventually you get a copy of the book and that's it. You don't have any contact with them really in terms of developing anything. And so there have been a few that I have developed relationships with and that's been really nice to sort of see them to, to how they work and everything like that. I have a very special relationship with my publisher in Brazil. They're particularly wonderful. And, and outside the United States, that's, I think, where I sell the most books. Have you been down to Brazil? I have. I've been down twice, um, both times to go on book tours. The first one we turned into a family vacation, and then the second one was just work. And it's, it's amazing. The, the Brazilian readers are so enthusiastic. I mean, people always say, you know, the stereotype of Latin Americans being, you know, really emotional and excited and everything. And, and, and at least for the readers, that is true. They treat their favorite authors like rock stars. Like I have to have security, which is crazy. You know, I walk in and they spot me and they start screaming and cheering. And I, you know, I took a video and showed it to my family and they were like, oh my God, that's so weird. <laughs> And, and it's, you know, and, and the signing has gone forever because, you know, I sign the books and they have a professional photographer there who takes your picture with every single person. And then they all go, they get uploaded so people can get them off the web. So, you know, you sign and then you're like, and then you sign. And, and, and so it, it's really, it's wonderful, but exhausting. So like, you know, you're, you're up, you have an adrenaline rush for a while. And then when you're done, I just turn to, you know, the people I'm traveling with from the publishing house. I'm like, I just want to go back to my room and I'll, I'll just eat something from the mini bar. And they're like, you're the cheapest author to take anywhere because like, I don't ever, I'm, I'm, I'm too exhausted to even order room service. I'm just like, I'll just eat the Pringles and the Diet Coke, you know? <laughs> uh, that's well, it sounds like, it sounds like it's both fun, but, but also really exhausting. Like, the kind of trip you maybe need a holiday from yeah. afterwards. Yeah, um, but but still, it's been really wonderful. I, I I would very much love to go back um, when when anybody can travel. Yeah, when this is all over. Um, if someone is watching who hasn't read any of your books yet, uh, where would you suggest they start? Well, you know, if it's somebody who doesn't normally read romance, which probably isn't your group, but if if it is, I I often recommend What Happens in London because I feel like it turns a few of the romance tropes on their head and in some ways not really what people expect of romance. Um, if, if they are a romance reader, I usually will recommend The Duke and I since it is the first of the Bridgerton series, which is my most popular series. Um, all my books are written very carefully so that you don't need to read any of the series in order. Although um, sort of like if you, if you can, why not? But you won't be lost. Um, but I often recommend that, and especially I think a lot of people have been wanting to read that with the show coming up. A lot of people like to read the book first. Yes. Um, and then uh, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about First Come Scandal, because that's your latest release, and um, if there's anyone who hasn't read it yet. Oh, so First Come Scandal is about Georgiana Bridgerton, who is, so this is the generation before the sort of, or the OG Bridgertons. Um, so she would be the aunt to all these siblings and she's she's the youngest in her family and she grew up with asthma um, Or what we would call asthma. I think I think actually they didn't call it the asthma then although it had a slightly different definition um, And so she's been very overprotected by her family And so when all the other sibs and everything could good run around and be like, you know wild crazy people out in the country, you know, her mom made her stay inside and everything. And so that's really kind of shaped her life a little bit. And she has been, uh, she gets kidnapped by a suitor who wants to marry her for her money and, and she gets away. And she, but when the book opens, she's back, but you know, she's kind of ruined, you know, and, and so she really, it, she's got like this little proto feminist streak because she's realizing, you know, just how unfair her society is like she she's I mean she is really ticked off that you know she now is ruined and you know the scandals touched her and people are whispering about her and the guy who actually caused all this is basically getting off scot-free you know people are probably like cheering him on and so she's and I don't think she'd ever questioned that aspect of society before because she hadn't had to it hadn't really touched her so much um and so she's she's pretty pretty darn mad and uh, Nicholas is uh, a Rokesby, the family, you know, the boy next door. And he's a medical student. He's the youngest also. So he knows he's not going to inherit the title. He's, he, he needs to make his way in the world. Um, you know, as much as somebody who comes from that much family money does. I mean, he, he recognizes his privilege too. But he, he, so he's off. He 
goes to school in Edinburgh because that's that would be the best place in the English speaking world to study medicine at the time. And his father, who is Georgie's godfather, basically summons him home and says, you need to come home. There's an emergency. And so he does because, you know, if your father does that at that time. You, you go. And his father basically says, you need to marry her. And he's just, what? And so um, he, he's not initially immediately amenable to this idea because, you know, it comes out of nowhere. And then, of course, when he finally comes around to it, he asks her and, well, I won't tell you what happens. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a great setup. Um, now, uh, when I looked at your website, I see that um, you have a graphic novel coming out next I year. I do. I do. Oh, Miss Butterworth and the Mad Baron. And that sounds like such fun. So um, can you tell us the story behind that? Oh, I, it's, yes. I'm super excited about this. Um, I'm, I, can, I even have my phone here, so I'll see if I can pull up like a little picture to share. Um, so in my books, um, sorry, I, I should be better at finding, talking and finding things at the same time. Um, let's see all photos. Okay, we'll find something in a minute. There's been, as I said before, I like these ongoing stories or, or you know, things for readers. And so uh, in It's In His Kiss, which was the seventh book of the Bridgerton series, was the first time I, I had two characters reading from this book called Miss Butterworth and the Mad Baron. And it was Hyacinth, the heroine of that book. And the youngest Bridgerton was reading it to Lady Danbury, who's this, you know, um, you know, cantankerous old lady who's been in a number of books before. And she, she goes to her house every once a week and reads to her from it. And it's just this dreadfully over the top Gothic novel. And it was so much fun to write. Um, and, you know, things like every, you know, and the every, every end of chapter, the woman is like hanging from a cliff. She's hanging from a window ledge. She's broken both her legs. She's been kidnapped by pirates. You know, all these things. Like everything happens to her. And, you know, the whole time Hyacinth is like, you know, this book really sucks. I mean, she doesn't say it like that. She's like, this is ridiculous. And, and but, you know, Lady Danbury really likes it. And so there's this ongoing joke that whoever, this book comes up and somebody in the, one of the characters is like, I don't understand why this is so popular. It's so keeps going on like it's this hugely popular novel um and so I started getting Miss Butterworth and the Mad Baron and I I can't you know it's it's really fun to write paragraphs of really bad writing but I mean the whole point of it is supposed to be like really dreadful the writing is just lurid and purple and overblown and then my sister is a cartoonist, and so I got the idea of actually doing it as a graphic novel. And so we've been developing that for some time, and it's, it's been so much fun. So here, here's something I can show you. Hold on. Oh, my phone just died. There we go. Let's see if... Okay. Hold on a minute. Let's see. Save image. All right. This will work better. So this is something she did. So one of the funny things about the... Um, the book is it's kind of a legendary set. The heroine's mother is pecked to death by pigeons. And you don't actually see that in Miss Butterworth and the Mad Baron as it appears in the novels. Um, and so the pigeons, of course, had to become like a big part of the graphic novel. So we did this funny little, let's see, can you see that? Yes. <laughs> so it's backwards. So, we did this so like one pigeon's like, hey, social distance lady. So those are two of the pigeons. That's Jean-Claude and Sylvia uh, for two of our pigeons. And um, it's really fun to work with all the pigeons in the story too. And, um, and it's been a totally different process. For one thing, I've never worked so closely with another person. I mean, I've done anthologies, but this is different. But you have to map out the story in a different way, um, you know, because it has to be mapped out. Age and then, you know, panel by panel what's going to happen and so it's been very very interesting um i'm i don't do any of the illustrations my sister does all the illustrations but i really think people will love it and um it's it's i i can't think of anything quite like it so it's going to be really fun and it actually i think would be appropriate for kids too um who might want a funny graphic novel it would you know there's no there's i mean i guess there's kissing but um nothing worse than that you know you've got you know these crazy pigeons and it's, it's, it's going to be really fun. It's like a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I am too. So hopefully it will, I mean, I would think it will reach you in Australia. So um, Otherwise, I'll have to order it from University Bookstore. Yes. Well, I'm sure we'll do a lot of things. And um, I'm, 
I know that we're going to be making these really cool, like limited edition pigeon magnets that people can have. Oh, okay. Um, that right now it's sort of, you can do it for a, um, I was trying to raise money for a literacy charity. And um, unfortunately, right as I was gearing up to try to promote that, we had the pandemic and it kind of fell by the wayside. But um, probably if you order an autograph book from University Bookstore, it will come with some wonderful pigeon magnets, I would think. Well, that is very, very tempting. So um, I'll, I'll make a little note in my diary to click on that next year. Yeah, I, I can't vouch for the shipping costs, but um, it, I think it will be just a whole lot of fun. I mean, just, I'm, I can't even tell you how excited I am about it. It just, I, I think also just, you know, works a very different part of my writer's brain. So that's been really nice for me too, because I've been doing, I mean, sort of same, same, but different. Mm -hmm. For the 25 years, I've been writing you know, the same type of novel and, you know, trying to make the, each one different. That's one of my big goals is not to write the same novel over and over again, but it, you know, they're a similar structure. And so I really like to change up how I do things from time to time. And this, this is definitely the biggest departure for me. Okay. Well, as I said, something to look forward to. Um, we're going to have to wrap up now. So okay. if I could ask you to hold up your um, pleasure hunt code. Yes. Hold on a minute. Sorry, it's, it's a little funny because it's, okay, how's, how's that? That's beautiful. We can see it perfectly. Thank you very much, Julia. Though it's all backwards, but. Uh, no, it's actually, it's, it's perfect. It's absolutely oh, really? fun. Oh. Yeah, I can okay. read it perfectly. It looks backwards to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for your time and we'll chat again soon. And um, yeah, I wish you, um, Fingers crossed that um, we get a vaccine for the virus soon and that everybody's stress levels can go down. Yes, well, we're, there, there will be testing here in Seattle soon. So um, my husband's part of the virus testing, uh, the vaccine testing. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed.